What's up everybody, Joe Brown here. This is the Heresy Financial Show and the inflation report just came out showing inflation rose by 8.3% from April last year through April this year. That is of course, if you believe the official inflation numbers. Now this was shockingly a much higher number than what all analysts expected. They were expecting to see a lower number to say, hey, inflation has peaked, but it's looking like inflation is much more embedded than what they expected. The worst part about this is, 13 straight months in a row now when adjusted for inflation, wages have declined for American workers. Not a good sign. So we are going to dive into exactly what's going on with this inflation report right now, what prices are moving up, what prices are showing some signs of relief, and what we can expect moving forward because it has implications for markets, especially bonds. Ready? Let's dive in. So it is looking like inflation is sticking around much longer than policymakers anticipated. Even after they gave up the word transitory long ago, they were anticipating and many analysts were anticipating that the inflation numbers would start to decline significantly as the Federal Reserve has been tightening recently. Let's take a look at this article from Bloomberg. We can see that core consumer prices rose 0.6%. That is month over month that exceeded all the estimates. The estimates came in an average of 0.4% instead of what actually came out, which was this 0.6%. Let's dive in here and see what inflation has been doing recently. This black line is core, and then the gray bars are the full CPI. Now these are month over month numbers. So March had a bigger change from February than we saw April have from March. But don't let this chart fool you. This is month over month change in prices. Let's look back at it. This bottom here is zero. So just because this bar is much smaller than this bar, these are not showing the absolute level of prices. These are showing the change in prices from the month before. So just because this is a small bar doesn't mean inflation wasn't there. It doesn't mean prices went down. It actually means prices still went up. They just didn't go up as much as prices went up in March from the month before. But it is significant that the month over month change was much smaller in April than it was in March. And we're going to come back to that in a little bit to see what implication that has. But for now, let's take a look back at this chart here, which is uh, the uh, breaking it down, breaking the inflation down by category. So this black line is going to be the headline number month over month, just like we were just looking at. And then the red line is going to be the core number month over month. And it breaks it down in each of these bars by category. So March, a big contribution to the price spike was energy, right? Obviously in March, there was a big spike in oil costs, translating to energy costs across the board being much higher. If we look back in April here, there's actually decline from the month before in energy costs. But it was more than made up for by services minus food and energy. Here, look, minus food and energy services increased. So it was made up for there. And then food as well, big spike in food prices, just like we've been seeing for months and months and months now. Food prices just continue to go up. But just because energy costs were down month over month, that doesn't mean they weren't up year over year because April of last year, energy costs were much lower than they were April of this year. In fact, energy costs were up 13.7% year over year from April. That is the biggest advance since 2008. Shelter costs, which includes rent of primary residence and owner's equivalent rent, which is an absolute garbage way to measure cost of housing. Even so, shelter costs were up 0.5% month over month for a third straight month. So in very simple terms, last year, if it costs you $50,000 to pay all of your bills, this year it's costing you $54,000 to pay all of your bills. Same bills, same exact stuff, prices went up from 50,000 to 54,000. That's 8%. Now that wouldn't be a problem if on average people were making $55,000, 58,000, $60,000, but that's not what's happening. People are getting raises, wages are increasing, but not as much as prices. In fact, 
when you adjust for inflation, average hourly earnings fell 2.6% in April from a year earlier, which is the 13th straight decline. That means your bills went from 50,000 to 54,000, but your income went from 50,000 to 52,000. So how are people paying the bills? If their cost of living is rising faster than your wages are rising, that means every month you're either having to go without or rely on savings or go into debt. Number one, let's take a look at household debt. Look at that. It has absolutely been skyrocketing. There was a little bit of a dip in 2020, but household debt has continued to climb. So households are continuing to dig themselves into a deeper and deeper hole, maintaining their standard of living maybe, or maybe not letting it fall as much, but going into debt as a result. And unfortunately, these savings have dried up. If we take a look here at personal savings as a percent of disposable income, we saw there was a spike in 2020, a little bit of a spike there in quarter one of 2021, but the savings are gone now. So people have been relying on savings in order to maintain their standard of living. Those savings are gone. So they are either going to have to decrease their, uh, their standard of living or continue to rely on more and more debt because this savings pool is now spent. And the worst part about this is that the higher cost of living for everybody is not primarily located in the luxuries, the things that people don't need. It's located primarily in the things that people do need, like food. In fact, the annual gain in food costs was the biggest since 1981. With baby food, like formula, we're seeing major baby food shortages right now. Things like that are what is skyrocketing in price, and the cost of fats and oils used for cooking rose the most since 2008. Now, specifically with these cooking oils, we've seen things like soybean oil, palm oil, vegetable oil, canola oil, all these cooking oils have been skyrocketing in price. A lot of that actually is due to Russia invading Ukraine. I know a lot of the inflation is being blamed on the pandemic and Putin, and most of it, that is not the result. But the price spikes in cooking oils right now, a lot of it can be blamed on that because that's where a lot of cooking oils for the world come from. The cooking oils thing, though, is one thing that I think is probably going to have a net benefit on society, given the fact that these vegetable oils, these are seed oils, they're basically poison. If you want to get oil out of an olive, all you have to do is squish it, oil comes out, you put it in a bottle, you sell it, right? If you want to get oil out of a seed, you have to put it through all these industrial processes, all these machines with bleach and chemicals to extract. There's not that much oil in seeds. And so to get this oil out of seeds, you have to do a lot of stuff to it. It's not meant for human consumption, never was. And about a hundred years ago when humans started eating seed oils, well, that's when all of the major chronic diseases started to rise as well. So it's probably a good thing if we eat less seed oil. But I digress. The solution, if the Federal Reserve actually wants to curb inflation, would be to hike rates to 5% or higher, according to Dudley, who is the former Federal Reserve Bank of New York president. And here's where things get dicey. If we look at interest rates, if we look at yields today, we see at the short end of the curve, interest rates have been increasing. This is factoring in the higher likelihood that the Federal Reserve will continue to have to raise rates maybe by a half a percent each time throughout the rest of this year as inflation is a lot more sticky than what they thought they're going to have to raise rates to try and stop it. However, if we look at the long end of the curve, 10-year, 20-year, 30-year, rates have declined. This means that the market is pricing in the higher likelihood that the Federal Reserve will have to continue to hike rates to fight inflation, but that it will spark such a big problem that it's pricing in the fact that at a future date, the Federal Reserve will have to lower rates again to deal with the economic collapse. In fact, Dudley says he thinks 4 to 5% and maybe in the future, he might even say 5 to 6% is where the Fed will have to get interest rates to be able to effectively fight inflation. He says the Federal Reserve has to tighten enough to slow the economy down and push the unemployment rate up. That's what's required, and they should be more forthright about explaining that to the American public. So he's basically saying here, we need to cause jobs to dry up, we need to cause the economy to slow down so that wages stop going up and people stop having the income to be able to spend that continues to drive prices higher. And this is the insidious nature of central planning because you have a few people, ivory tower elites, 
who are deciding the fates of all American citizens who are trying to work harder, save money, maintain their cost of living, and you have a few people who have been for years now determining, hey, the best thing for Americans is to punish the savers so that their savings lose purchasing power so that we get prices to rise. And now that that's happening and the standard of living for Americans is starting to get squashed because inflation has been increasing more than wages, now they're coming out and they're saying, now we need to wipe jobs out because people are making too much money. It's driving prices up too much. So now we need to come at them from the other side. We just hit them with the uppercut and now we need to finish them by wiping out jobs and causing a bunch of economic pain to slow down these prices rising. The reality of what's happening here is that all of the crises that we've experienced economically for decades now are the creation of central planners, the creation of monetary and fiscal policy. And every single time you try and bail out the crisis and stop it from happening, all you're doing is creating the next one even bigger. And that's what we're going through right now. This is not the result primarily of Russia invading Ukraine or the pandemic. It is the choices that central planners make that influence everybody's financial lives. And they don't have the foresight to see that all of the things that they're messing with now are just causing worse problems down the road. Last chart we're gonna look at is M2. This is the total money supply we can see Obviously, there was a big spike here, and the growth rate of the money supply on average has been much higher since then than it was before 2020. But I want to show you something really interesting here. If we make it a percent change chart from a year ago, we can see that in 2020, obviously, the growth rate in the money supply spiked and then was growing really quickly year over year. But then in 2021, early 2021, the spending, uh, the growth rate of the money supply really started to slow down. That was mainly because of political gridlock. And uh, so the growth rate in the money supply started to drastically decline. Now, the thing to remember about monetary policy is it takes time for it to work its way into the real economy. It does not happen immediately. The changes in monetary policy do have a very quick effect on markets, especially bond markets, However, they do not impact the real economy immediately. It takes a lot of time for that uh, change in money supply to work its way throughout the economy. So the inflation we've been experiencing is starting to uh, it come to the end of that growth rate of the money supply. That, that was a big spike here up until uh, early 2021. Now we've been, since about a year ago, we've been experiencing much lower rates of money supply growth than we were experiencing before. So my anticipation is that the inflation rate will actually start to come down. Not because the Fed is fighting it now, but because the growth rate of the money supply very much slowed down over a year ago, and it's been slowing down ever since. This means the Federal Reserve is tightening into a, a, a situation that was tightening by itself already from the decline in the growth rate of the money supply, which is essentially a rug pull out from underneath the economy. So it's getting tightening on one side from a year ago when the money supply growth started declining, and then it's getting tightening from this side with the Federal Reserve starting to raise rates and sell assets off of its balance sheet. And so I think there's a very very good chance this tightening, they overdo it and tip us over into a crash, into deflation, into some uh, economic crisis that they're going to have to go back and reverse yet again. In the end, we will see what happens, but this is glaring evidence that it is time to end the Fed. We do not need a small group of people who are disconnected from economic reality making decisions that influence the financial lives of every single American citizen. Not not only are they not helping, but they're actively making things worse. As always, I really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.